It was really disturbing because when you've done it before and you feel like you have learned the lessons and you repeat the same thing over, it's just like, how did this, how did I get here? Like, I know better. I wrote a book on it. Like, there's no way that I could be here again. Hello, and welcome to the Authentic Wednesday podcast. Each week, my guests and I share our vulnerable behind-the-scenes stories of giving ourselves permission to take off our masks, let go of our expectations, and embrace our own path of freedom and authentic connection. I'm your host, Bianca Hughes, a lover of authenticity and a licensed professional counselor in Georgia. Hello and welcome to the Authentic Wednesday podcast. Thank you for joining us on the podcast today and taking the time out to listen to the podcast. This is episode 38 and I have a guest on the podcast today and we're going to go in and talk about a much needed conversation. She's going to be sharing her journey of narcissistic abuse and also experiencing abuse in a relationship. Julian J.J. Simmons is a former radio TV host. She's also a speaker, author, self-love coach, and creator of the movement Respect My Crown. Respect My Crown encourages women to deepen in spirituality, sisterhood, accountability, and service. Julian is also the founder of JJ's I'm Me Foundation that inspires teen girls to be the best version of themselves. Simmons has authored three books, Without Bruises, A Journey to Hope, Help and Healing, Respect My Crown, a 30-day affirmation journal to manifest your vision and her latest book, All Falls Down, a daily study of scripture to lift you up when life has knocked you down. Her motto is, we all come from greatness. It's inside each of us. My job is to pull it out of you so the world can see. So let's go ahead and get into the conversation. So hello, JJ, and welcome to the Authentic Wednesday podcast. It's so good to have you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I know. Like, I always think about how we met. (laughs) (laughs) We met in such an authentic way, right? (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. In the mall when you did your first book and um, we stayed in contact ever since. So it's just been a pleasure just to follow you and to know you and just, you know, really connect. So my favorite question, what does authenticity mean for you? It means being free to be who you are, completely who you are at your core. I like that. Really be you. <laughs> <laughs> Have you always been you? Do you think you've always been authentic? Um, you know, it's hard. I don't think so. I think that I think it's like uh, just depending on where I am at the time, like being on the radio for over 20 plus years. It's, you know, it's like being an actress. So even when I think I'm being me, right, I'm still being who either the audience wants me to be or being who my employer wants me to be. But I think for the most part, I have. Yeah. What would you say that was? What was that mask that you would wear when it was for the audience? What was that? The all, it's all good mask. <laughs> like, <laughs> the it's all good mask. Like, I remember being depressed for a whole year. And I talk about it in my book, Without Bruises. Um, it was the hardest thing. Like, I would literally cry when I would turn off the microphone and just be in tears. But as soon as it's time to click on the mic, I'm like, hey, what's going on? It's JJ, you know, and I'm back in in that mode. But I remember I came out of that depression and that following year, my father passed away. And I remember being on the air a week after his memorial service. And I was, I couldn't even do it. Like I just could not do it. And I just had a total breakdown on the air. And I was, I was telling my listeners, like, I don't know how to be right now because I want to be able to give you what you need. Cause as a radio personality, that's our job. We want to make people smile and laugh and inform them and entertain them. But at that moment, I just could not be. 
And so I had a whole, a whole breakdown that day on the air and I just kind of talked it out and it was cool because people called in and they were like, be sad. Like, like that's where you wow. just lost your dad. You were really close to him. People would hear me talk about him all the time and play jokes on my dad on the air and stuff. So people knew I was really close to him. So I think that was probably one of the first times that I felt comfortable enough to just take the mask off and say, you know wow. what, the day is just not okay. It's not good. Wow. What was that like to get that response of, yeah, it's okay to be sad. What was that like for you? Yeah, it was very freeing. It was interesting because my boss came in and she was upset and she was like, hey, you got to get it together. And I went off on my boss, like, and I love her deeply, like, that's like my people. And I remember going off, like, how do you tell somebody who's just lost somebody to get it together? And I'm like, when people are calling in here telling me it's okay to just be like, feel how you feel right now. And what you're telling me is get it together. What does get it together look like? I don't know. I don't even know what it looks like because this is something I've never experienced before. You know what I mean? But to know that people could empathize because that's what people want, right? You feel comfortable when people can empathize and say like, oh, I've been there before. Yeah, I just lost my mom. Or it, and that felt so free. It felt good. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we need, don't we? We need that empathy. We need that oh connection. Gosh. We need that space to be like, it's, it's okay. It's yeah. okay. So a time, you know, I didn't listen to you on the radio, but of course I did in Houston. <laughs> but a time that I saw you take off that mask and I was like, OMG. <laughs> was, is it two years ago? It's been two years. Yeah. Okay. And I remember just like seeing you say, I am going to let rip and talk my truth on narcissistic abuse. And I just saw these like videos and I was like, wait a minute, because <laughs> in my mind, you were, I follow you on Instagram and I'd see these pictures of you and your ex at the time, your boyfriend at the time, but your ex now. And you just look so happy and just all these different things that you yeah. were doing. And then you were like, oh, this is narcissistic abuse. And I was like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what happens? Like how? Yeah. How? Yeah. yeah. Like how? And, um, it was, you know, and we'll talk a bit about that, but it, it, you know, your story is like the thing that I tell people all the time. You cannot compare your life and look at someone on Instagram and think that everything is okay. Yeah. Because yeah. it's not. It's so not. let's talk about that, especially since it wasn't your first time being in an abusive relationship right. and then this happening. Yeah. What was that like? Oh gosh, it was really disturbing <laughs> because when you've done it before and you feel like you have learned the lessons and you repeat the same thing over, it's just like, how did this, how did I get here? Like, I know better. I wrote a book on it. Like, there's no way that I could be here again. But looking back at it now, like, understanding that. It was different. It was a different person. I still opened up my heart to be love, you know, and to love someone. And um, this person was really good. Like he was, he's the, he should be the face for narcissists, like the spokesperson, <laughs> because he was really good. And you realize that just as a human being, it, it's still easy to be fooled. And it's easy for us, especially as women, to question our intuition. And that's what I did on this second time. Like the, this second time, I saw the signs. I mean, from the beginning. And I still was like, no, nah. you know, I brushed it under the rug. My therapist at the time felt like I had PTSD. So the minute I met this guy, when I would go to therapy, I would start talking about him. I'm like, this seems so familiar. And she's like, you know, I think you're just suffering from PTSD because, you know, as a therapist, and she even admitted this to me later, you know, she's focused on the brain. 
And, um, and she said, what I, what I should have done was I should have told you to really lead with your gut because your gut told you something didn't feel right from the beginning. And, and I mean, I can see why she would think it was PTSD because, you know, you're bringing this stuff up and you're, (laughs) even though it's been 10 years, but it was, it was exactly that. It was that I was experiencing the same thing again. Yeah. It was very disappointing, but I'm so grateful that it happened. So can you tell me, I think this is really important. Can you tell me why did you stay, even though it it was the same and familiar, I'm sure there are things that you enjoyed and you appreciate in the relationship. And the reason why I want you to share is because people often beat themselves up for staying or can't comprehend how people stay. So yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, some of the reasons why I stayed, well, one, this was like a godly man. So he was different than the first guy who didn't know nothing about Jesus. <laughs> like this person, I mean, he knows his word. He's like a minister. He's praying for me day and night. And it's so hard when you have a person who prays for you every morning, treats you like crap throughout the day and then prays for you at night. It was so confusing. It was like, but he's good. Like he's a good person. That's one reason. One other reason is like you want love. Like I, I'm like, this can work. And on paper, we look great together. He's a speaker. I'm a speaker. He has a nonprofit. I have a nonprofit. Like on paper, we look perfect. And I kept that idea in my mind of what this could be. And I was going to bust my butt to make sure that I could make that come to life. And then also like, The pressure of like, this is the first relationship that I had publicly. Um, That was not my choice. He actually posted pictures of us and I was like, oh, okay, that's what we're doing. All right. You know, and so I followed suit and I started posting pictures and then there was like pressure from other people like, oh, my God, like this is the perfect couple. And Uh, so it's like, oh, well, then I got to really make this work (laughs) because people are inspired by me. Like people want to see this. And wow, (laughs) if I would have if I could do it all over again, like the minute like I had this, I had one dream the minute I had that dream and I actually called him and said, I can't do this. And I told I made the mistake of telling him about the dream and he talked me right up out of it. And I just should have went with my gut. The dream was so clear and so vivid. And that should have been it. That was my ticket up out of there. And I just talked too much, (laughs) you know, like, and that's what narcissists do. They're going to be like, you tripping. What are you talking about? They ain't got nothing to do with me. Let me tell you what it is. You got, you know, and then it's, you know, it's all on me. And yeah, trusting your intuition is just so important. Wow. Wow. But sometimes, sometimes as we're human beings, we can get talked out of that or, or question that. Oh, like you said, like you said, it happens. Yeah. And I just want everyone to know that that happens because I think that's the thing that makes it so hard. And then you had the added pressure of being in the public eye. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did work together on domestic abuse, right? And it's like, imagine we're on stage talking to people about abuse and we're showing videos and I'm literally on the stage looking at the videos like, and I remember telling them one time, I was like, you can't see that this is us. Like, that's us right there in the video. I'm like, what are you talking about? No, that is us. Like the arguments that are keep going in a circle that you can't get out. Like, why does this argument keep happening over and over and over again? And it, I could see me in the videos and still and still stuck in there. How is that? How are you able to see those videos and stuck in there? It's like you talk yourself out of it. And that's the problem with, you know, being in an abusive relationship. It's like you have to understand There's no logic talking to somebody who is abusive or narcissist. There's no logic. Like you are expecting to have a conversation where two people can hold themselves accountable. And this is just not going to (laughs) happen. It's just impossible. So it's almost as like I'm you're waiting for this person to agree with what's happening. Yep. And you're waiting for that. And so they're not agreeing. So you're hoping one day they'll agree and I guess perhaps change. 
but it's not that you can't wait for them. What I'm hearing is you, you can't wait for them to agree. You have to decide that for yourself, even if they're not agreeing. Like, you know, what's wrong, you know, Mm -hmm. what you feel in your gut that it's not right. Like this doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. This, I, you can step back and you can see exactly what's happening. The deflection, the blaming, the gaslighting, the manipulation, most relationships, there's the cheating. And it's just, you see it. Like you really see it, but you want this person to acknowledge it and they're never going to do it. They don't see anything wrong with what they're doing at all. And that's the struggle. And the problem is you see the good things that are still taking place, right? Oh, he took me out for, you know, to my favorite restaurant. And it's just like, you're holding so tight to these great moments or wanting those great moments to come back. Like, if I could just hold on to this, if I can just keep this right here. And it's not going to happen because later, you know, it's something. And it brings you right back to that place where you end up feeling really bad. Mm -hmm. Sounds so familiar. I've heard that. So many times, um, unfortunately, in regards to abuse, um, whether it's abusive, physical, sexual, or, you know, the narcissistic and, and, you know, people make judgments, but this is the reason why people yeah. say, because it, it, it does go to the human and then it goes down to the brain and, and the manipulation that happens. Did you, um, did you feel guilty um, when you were on the tour? And you were seeing yourself and then you were talking to younger people about the signs. How did you deal with that? Oh, gosh. You know, our very first day of the tour, we were at a school and we had not really rehearsed um, this little skit that we're supposed to do. And the skit, we're supposed to be like getting into this argument where he's mad about what clothes I'm wearing. Like he was like, I told you to wear this. Why are you wearing that? And so we started off with this skit. And then at the end of the program, we're supposed to show you the healthy way that this conversation should have happened. And he couldn't do it. And it was just like, what seems so obvious, like, hey, acknowledge my feelings, apologize, like the things that you that seem to be common sense. He couldn't do it. And the kids pointed it out. They were like, I don't think he seems very apologetic. And I remember feeling so embarrassed and then it was, but it's like, it still wasn't sinking in that this is what it was. But later on during the tour, it was like, it really kicked in. I was like, you know what? Even the kids are noticing you don't have remorse. You don't know how to share that feeling that, you know, of accountability. You cannot do it. It's not in you. And so, yeah, I did feel guilty because I'm like, gosh, you you can't really teach this because you don't even live this. Like Mm -hmm. you don't know how to live it. And I just would have never known. And it's at some point it's just too late. What do you do? Like Mm -hmm. you can't be on the tour that we did. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It was so bad. So tell me what made you decide to go public? Cause I am sure in your position, being such an influencer, being a radio host and, and so many people knowing you and, you know, normally having to wear this mask. What made you say, I have to go public and I don't really care? Yeah, uh, it was really a hard decision. Uh, I spoke to my therapist. I called her first and she said to me, you are holding so much anger and so much pain and it has to go somewhere and she said tell your story and she said this time it's not a book like people need to see your face they need to be able to really relate and you need to just get it all out just talk and I was like "Ah, I'm gonna ask some other people what they think (laughs) so I called one of my really close friends Danielle and it was almost verbatim. Danielle said, you have anger. And what happens is if you don't get all of this out, you will get sick. And we've already seen how being in a toxic relationship has really, it was starting to destroy my body physically. And so I was like, all right, and I'm going to tell you 
the day I did those videos, I called my friend, Jessica. She prayed for me about 30 minutes. And I was like, I want you to pray that every word that comes out of my mouth is the truth. Like, I'm not, I don't want to exaggerate anything because that's how we do when we tell a story, right? I was like, let everything that comes out of my mouth be from God. Like just his words to come out. And, and then I just did it. I did not expect to be on the camera crying. The, the guy had a person come and film it for me. And mm-hmm. he was in there crying. I was <laughs> like, oh my God. Like, so wow. that makes you cry more when you see somebody else crying. And I was just like, it just needed. And, and I'm so glad I did it because I it was embarrassing. It's so mm-hmm. embarrassing to do something again. Do so you wrote a book about it. You've been talking about this and get your power back and do da 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 and you're back in the same place. So it, I knew I was gonna feel embarrassed. And, you know, disappointed and the guilt of, you know, staying around and all of that. But so glad I did it because on the other side of that was a whole movement that I did not even see coming. There were so many women and men who, you know, I had like almost 200 DMs that night that I released that video. And I remember responding back to every single person. There was people like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm going through depression too. Oh my God, I dated a narcissist. I know how you feel, or I'm in an abusive relationship now. How did you get out? Like, and it was just like that moment like of clarity. Like there's your aha moment. Oh, so the video isn't about me. It's not even about him. Like it's about the people that need help. And I did my work for the last two years to really get my butt together. And it feels good to be in a place where I can now really help other people. Wow. It's bigger than you. It was bigger than you. Oh, it was so much. It was way so bigger than you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How has it propelled you and shaped you today? Like, what are you doing with all of it today? Oh, gosh. So it was crazy because after the video, I had 15 women who had also dated the same person and reach out to me. They're all over the place. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, this is a lifetime movie. Okay. And so I wanted to gather with these women because anybody who's been through an abusive relationship knows that you are dying for validation. Like, you want so badly for someone to just tell you you're not crazy. You know, what you experienced really happened. And it's very hard because when you're dating a narcissist, They are trying to destroy your whole reputation and who you are and make everyone think you're crazy. So you are just like, please, somebody, (laughs) somebody tell me, you know what I'm going through. So I wanted to meet with these women. And so I gathered with them, not all of them, maybe six of them. And I invited some women who have dated narcissists to do a dinner party. And it kicked off this series of Respect My Crown dinner series. And we video recorded it. It's on my IG live if people want to see it. And it's just the conversation. And it wasn't about that person the whole time. It was just about healing. And we did like healing activities with my therapist. Like, you know, ladies had questions like, well, why did this happen? And, you know, and how do you move on from this? And why is it like three years later? And I feel like I still had it. Like so many people had great questions. And so I took that and then I did what's called the gathering where we gathered 60 women and just had a conversation about narcissistic abuse. And it's just been a, an amazing movement. And then that, of course, you know, turned into a podcast. And there's just so it's just it just kept going, you know, another book, an affirmation book, because there was things that I needed to remind myself of. So I had to do a book to affirm myself. And I mean, it really is just spiraling wow. into something really big. Wow. And yeah, and I've seen a couple of the videos and just the podcasts and all of those things that you didn't know, but were so needed. How did it, I have one question, because one, one of those women or young women that's really important is your daughter. Yes. Yeah. How was it? for her in that experience and then helping her through. How yeah. Was oh gosh. It was, um, it was so hard. 
it's already hard because, you know, it's like her, her dad and I have been divorced since um, she was four. And so she hasn't been around any guys that I have dated. Mm-hmm. So the one time, right, that I bring a man around and he's the, the stuff that she has witnessed has just been sickening, like his rage and how many times. I mean, it just everywhere we would go, there was just some type of humongous argument over nothing. And and she's always in tears. And so I was so disappointed in myself. There was a lot of that guilt you were just talking about. Like there was a lot of guilt because of that. Like she's not supposed to witness this. Like what kind of example am I as a mother who's trying to show my daughter what a healthy relationship should look like? Cause she hasn't been able to really see one ever. And so um, after the breakup, you know, I, I sat down and talked to her and she's 13 now. And I've always been open with my daughter and very transparent as, as much as I can on her level. And so we talked about it. You know, you saw it's not good. You know, what are the things that you saw that, um, that you know wasn't, wasn't good for a healthy relationship? Well, I saw yelling and he would be very angry and he would make you cry. And, you know, there was one time she ran down the steps, she was about to fight him. And I was like, <laughs> Just shut the door right on time because I don't even know like what it would look like. Like he had no, he did not care that she was around. And we talked about it and I assured her, I was like, I I won't do this again. And um, I have to do better at making better decisions. I have to trust my gut when I know that something isn't right about somebody. And, um, you know, just trying to be a better example. Mm. And so, and she holds me accountable to that. <laughs> yeah. But if it were up to her, she don't want me with nobody. She's like, just me and you, mommy, just me and you. Like, Listen, <laughs> oh, gotta get it together. Yeah. So how, two, two things about that, just for our listeners, what are some of the signs and how do you start the steps to to get out if you are in that relationship? Um, well, some of the signs I think people need to be aware of if you're dating a narcissist or someone who is abusive, really one is just paying attention to how you feel, you know, or are you noticing that you're always drained after conversations with them? Do you notice that they're always talking about themselves? <laughs> it's just the whole world revolves around them, you know, not taking accountability. Do you feel like, you know, it's, it should be common sense if we do something hurtful and we do that in regular relationships, right? Not even abusive relationships. We can easily hurt someone, not intentionally, but you should be able to hold yourself accountable. You know what? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Um, but if you don't receive that, like they don't see anything wrong with their behavior, that is a, a huge red flag. Gaslighting, like when you, it's, oh, it is such a real thing. Like people need to know if you feel like you are crazy, like this person makes me feel like I'm crazy. Like I asked you, why are you on the phone with this girl at 3 a.m. in the morning? Cause I see the message on your phone pop up right there. Like, hey boo, <laughs> like, and you're going to try to tell me this is my sister or you're going to say like, you know, you're tripping or they say, well, I don't, when your dad calls you at three in the morning and you're like, what's that going to do with the price of tea in China? <laughs> like, and so when you feel like, like, am I crazy all the time? Mm. That is a real thing. They want you to feel crazy. Um, manipulation. And one big thing for me was I, I learned a new term in this relationship, which was triangulation. Cause I've never heard of it. And it's when you're like, they're pitting you against other people. So for this person, it was his mother. Man, I don't know. I just don't know why my mom doesn't like you. I mean, you know, I know you haven't done anything to her, but she just doesn't think that, you know, you can handle my anointing or that your wife material. And you just saying those things has now created this dynamic between you and your, and maybe it's true. Maybe it's not like, I don't know. But that's triangulation. You're using other people's words to make me feel a certain way. Or, you know, people do this quite often too. Like, 
he would say, man, there's this girl at the gym trying to holler at me. I, I know she, she has to know I got a girlfriend, right? And it's like, like trying to make you feel jealous or mm-hmm. that too can be triangulation. Like you're trying to make me feel insecure based on someone else. And it's, uh, you have to pay attention to those things. Yeah. But you know, like, you know, when it doesn't feel right. And if nothing else, just trusting what your gut is saying, that God's voice inside of you is like, hey, this ain't him. This ain't the one. <laughs> the person that I have for you is not going to treat you like this. You got to know that, like, this isn't right. And you got to make moves quickly. I didn't move as fast as I should have, but I moved faster than I did in the, from the first relationship, which was good. So that's yeah. progress, right? Yeah. Progress. I moved a little bit quicker yeah. to get out of that relationship. But I'm going to tell you, like, getting out is tough. And I tell this to the women during my self-love coaching sessions who have experienced this, that it's really the hardest part of it is getting out. Because the pain that you're going through when the smoke clears and you're under, you have that understanding of what just happened, it's painful. Right. And I ain't going to sugarcoat it for people. I ain't telling you to stay because you need to go. But I'm going to tell you, it's, it's not easy. I relate it to like smoking cigarettes. It's like you can easily tell a person, hey, here's a YouTube video of what your lungs look like when you smoke cigarettes. And a person who smokes will be like, yeah, I know that. And it's still hard for me to quit because it's an, it feels like an addiction. Right. Wow. And that's what it feels like. When you're trying to exit a relationship, it feels like an addiction. It's like, I know that I don't need to be here, but I can't figure out why it's so hard for me to break apart. And you got to really dig deep and remember like you're who you are, who you were before you met that person, what it is that you truly desire, what it is that you really deserve for yourself. It's work. It takes real work. And I'm just going to be real. Like for me, it took, it took my mentor, one of my mentors just talking to me like, hey, he ain't the one. And he didn't even know who this person was. I've never talked to him about him. It was like he was heaven sent. Like this person showed up at the right time. It was like, hey, he ain't it. He's not the one. And you need to leave now. He's abused you. And I was like, abused? Like, what's it? And it's like, that's exactly what it was. And having to really get all the strength that I can (laughs) to separate myself. And it was like doing it cold turkey. Like, I'm going to block you. I'm going to not take any risk. Like, I don't want to, I don't even want to talk to nobody who knows you. (laughs) Like, I'm going to cut it all off and, um, and, and keep it moving. And that's tough because um, I would imagine because I hear this a lot, is that I went cold turkey, I broke it off, I'm the one that's broken up, but I still miss him, or there's parts of me that still want to be with this person, and that could be tough. Yeah, Uh, because you're still remembering the good times. Like, you know, this person is a great speaker, and there were times where, you know, he would help me with some of my speeches, and some of my writing. And it was just like, man, I, I miss that because those were so good. Those moments were really good. But those were just moments. And it's like at the end of the day, you know, the, the full experience was the most horrific thing I've ever had. Like, I, I don't wish that on anybody. My whole brain was twisted. And I, and I would quickly, as soon as I would, I'll think about those great moments, I'll be like, whoo. But I am glad he does not exist in my world anymore because the bad was all the way bad. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to remember that. Like, you know, it's normal. Why wouldn't you? You, It's not that you didn't love the person. So, of course, you're going to have the normal feelings of you miss somebody and you don't sound crazy saying it. You shared moments with that person. You cared for that person. You created a picture in your mind that was now destroyed because you had this whole idea of what you wanted, which is what we do a lot as women. We paint this perfect picture. And so when that gets wiped out, then there's the grief, right? You go through the stages of grieving. 
And that's a part of it. Feeling like you miss that person. It's normal. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh my gosh, this is so good. It's such a good topic and a needed topic. So what do you want to say to our listeners, especially not just the people who are in the abusive, but even those people who, it may not even be abusive, but like are hiding behind some shame and they don't want to share or they're in the media eye, the social media or their social media influencer and like, you know, they're painting all these pictures, but this is what's really going on. Gosh, share your truth and don't be afraid to share your truth. There are so many different ways that we can do that. You know, I don't think that everyone is meant to write a book. I don't think everybody's meant to, you know, do a video blog or whatever, but you know, you have to really know you and and the best way for you to speak your truth. But just know, like, it's so necessary for us to speak our truth and to continue to do that because it's how other people grow. If I didn't do that video that day, then there would have been so many other people who would be afraid to speak up. There'd be so many people who did not, who felt like they were alone. Like, oh, shoot, these are real feelings that other people have. Like, I'm not crazy. I thought it was just me. Like, so many women feel like it's just me. This has to be just me. And when you feel alone, that's when that depression kicks in, like overload, Mm -hmm. the stress, the suicidal ideation, like all of those things appear when you feel like I am by myself. And so Mm -hmm. people need your voice. You know, there are people who can't speak up, you know, like look at what COVID has done for all these abusive relationships. There's so many people who can, they are at home right now with their abusers wishing that they could go back to work right now because just so they could get away. And it's like, they need somebody who can share in their experience to make them feel uh, empowered and inspired and motivated to, to have something better. So you got to speak. You got to share your truth. Thank you. Thank you. So what are some resources? I know your book is a great resource. What are some other resources that have been helpful for you? Yeah. So um, I'm going to tell you the book, The Shack. Mm. Now, yes, there's a movie. So if you're not a book reader, you could go to the movie. Okay. But I, I, I will say this, just like a lot of people say about movies and books, the book is so much better than the movie. Okay. But it's a big book, (laughs) but the shack changed my entire life. It helped me to forgive my abuser. It helped me to forgive my, my mother who was kind of the catalyst for why I enter these relationships and forgiveness was such a big piece of moving forward. And so I love the shack And then you're going to say this has nothing to do with abuse or anything, but the pursuit of happiness is like one of my favorite movies because the overall idea is just, you might have to go through the toughest storm, but if you really believe and you, and what it is that you really are purpose to do, then just know, go through the storm. Like the storm is going to happen. Sometimes the storm is going through an abusive relationship. Like that's the part that's, that was my journey. That was it. And I had to do it two times for two totally different reasons so that I can share these two different stories that will, that will relate to different people. It was a part of my journey and I'm so grateful for it because look at where I am today. So pursuit of happiness. I just love that movie. Cause I'm like, y'all was living at the subway in the bathroom. And it's like, but you know what? Look at where he is now. What an inspiration you are to your kid now. Like you pushed through it and took your kid along with you on that journey so he could see what happens when you finally get to the other side. Like, so those two things, the shack and pursuit of happiness. Thank you. And so where (laughs) can we, where can we shower you with love? Oh, yes. Uh, I am on Instagram, JJ on the mic. I am on Facebook, uh, JJ on the Mic fans, and my website is jjonthemic.com and all my books are there and my podcasts too. Cool. Well, thank you so, so, so much for this much needed conversation, honest and authentic conversation. It's been a pleasure having you. 
Thank you. I miss you, Bianca. That was a much needed conversation. I hope for those of you who are listening and perhaps have experienced some form of relationship abuse can really learn from what we, she shared and discussed on the podcast. I'm hoping that you feel validated and perhaps encourage if you are still in that situation to take some steps to leave. Of course, I will put all of the resources she shared in the show and I will put some additional resources related to domestic abuse. Please remember to tag us. Please remember to share the podcast and rate and review. Thank you so much. If you connected with what you just heard, please subscribe, rate and review the podcast. You can stay connected by following our Instagram, Authentic Wednesday Podcast and visiting our website, AuthenticWednesday.com. Remember, authenticity is a journey, not a destination.